Good morning. Have a seat. Good morning, Christ City Church. Hey, uh, my name is Matthew Watson. Uh, You can refer to me as the Reverend Doctor from this point forward. Just kidding. Uh, Most folks call me Watson, um, and I serve as an elder and pastor here. If I haven't met you, I really want to say welcome. Incredibly glad uh, that you're here. Hope that you're having a great weekend. Hope you got your your little gargles uh, to see the the eclipse that's happening. Y'all ready? Y'all locked in? Y'all not locked? Yeah, somebody. Sam's locked in. I don't know. There's a thing happening tomorrow. Don't know if you've noticed. This is an eclipse. Um, it's, uh, it's been a great weekend. Uh, it was so fun to see so many of you serving here at Minor and the other places uh, yesterday. And I, I have to say, like, what a tremendous way to kind of to finish off our Learning to Live series, uh, our discipleship series that we were in. Last Sunday on Easter, uh, we were able to celebrate baptism. And then a few days later, we, uh, on a Saturday, were out in the community serving in a variety of ways. And, and I think that the, in many ways, those bookends to the week, in many ways, I think, highlight deep truths about our faith. New life in Christ and the work of renewal of all things. Um, the way we articulate this uh, on our website, I'm going to reference our website a few times uh, today, which... Um, wasn't my plan, but just kind of how it worked out, uh, was a vision statement. And the, vi- and, and the things that we strive to see, and the way that we articulated it there was to say that uh, what we ache and long for is to see the flourishing of God's kingdom on display in every life and every sphere of life, every individual life. Following Jesus in baptism and discipleship and love of God and love of neighbor, every individual life, but every sphere of life. Spheres like education and educational systems, like here at Minor Elementary where we served, or DCPS. Spheres of life like creation and creation care at the Anacostia River Trail where folks served. Just economic opportunities as a sphere of life and community cohesion like at the Hyattsville Community Development Corporation, just to name a few. You see, Serve Day for us, it's not just about logging volunteer hours or doing good for a couple of hours, though we should never underestimate the power of neighbors serving together for the common good. But Serve Day yesterday, it's connected to this deep ache and this deep desire to see the kingdom come, well, to see the kingdom on display in every life and every sphere of life. And saints, that is exactly what you have participated in in these last few days. And I thank God for you, our city, our cities, give Hyattsville some, you know, love, our cities express gratitude for how you are living out your faith in these generous ways. And whether our neighbors are able to express it or not, you are in very tangible ways, embodied ways, pointing all of us, not just those of us that are here on Sunday, but our entire community. You're pointing all of us towards the day when Jesus finally and fully restores all that is broken and renews all that has been marred by the enemy. So thank you all. Give yourselves a hand. Thank you all for serving. Um, And for those that weren't able to serve yesterday, I thank you for your prayers and for supporting those that did. And if you're looking for ongoing ways to serve in the community, I'd love to talk further with you uh, uh, about um, ways that you can serve regularly or even um, episodic ways where you can connect with your neighbors and organizations that are doing amazing work um, in our community. So thank you for that. It's great to see all of those um, photos. Okay, I've got a question for you. I, I, so I want you to take a look at this image, and I want you to tell me if you know what it is. Not that image. That image. Do you know what that is? I think it has something to do with typing. Typing, good. Anybody else? <laughs> Anybody? Nobody? It's, it's uh, uh, let me ask you, goodness gracious. Let me ask you all this. How many of you have had, in your lifetime, taken a typing class? Yeah? That's a lot of y'all. How y'all going to not know what this is? When you put your hands, proper placement on the keys of a, like an old machine called a typewriter or a current machine called a computer, like if you put your hands in the proper placement and you just, that, that's, the, that's the order of, of the position. You got it? You know what I'm, you picking up what I'm putting down? Great. Perfect. Brilliant. Oh, uh, it's going to be a rough one. All right. So here's the deal. <laughs> this is, uh, uh, it's the pattern that you have when uh, you put your hands properly placed on a keyboard or on a typewriter. Um, and this is the proper image for where your hands should be. If you didn't know this, today you're getting a lot of information. I'm here to educate you on a whole host of things. Um, I took uh, ninth grade typing, Skyline High School, Dallas, Texas. Ms. Johnson was my teacher, and during that class, she would come through. We had electronic typewriters then. 
uh, which is a, I don't even know how to explain that, but it was, Ms. Johnson would come through and she would make sure that our hands were in the proper spot. And then uh, she would give us assignments out of the Mavis Beacon typing textbooks. Anybody go through that? Yeah, represent, perfect. Oh man, I, now company is good, community is forming. Um, and these books that I had, it was a book, but the books that I had, they didn't open like, like this. They open like this. I probably should have thought about this or got an image. They opened over the top because we had a little stand that we could do it so we wouldn't have to look at our hands. We could just look at the book, the Mavis book, and just type and go fast or try to go fast. So the books, they folded over the top, um, and we'd type different patterns. We would, uh, you know, until we learned sort of where all the letters were, muscle memory, you know, A, 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 S, 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 D, you know, space, all that, uh, so that we could learn where they were. And then we would graduated to typing sentences. We'd type the same sentence over and over and over, and then we'd get a couple of sentences, and then we built to paragraphs, and so we just, that's how we learned. We'd worked on our speed. We'd work on our accuracy. Speed was measured by how many words words you could type per minute and then accuracy was how many errors you made when you were typing out the prompt if we hit a certain speed or a certain accuracy then we could kind of go on to the next stage or turn the page or you know next chapter and if you didn't hit that well you got to go back you got to try again work on it keep going you know no shame but you got to do it again now <clears throat> just you know a lot of us, uh, you know, I think uh, in this room, I think some days we uh, might <laughs> feel like, let me own it. I won't put this on you. Let me not project. You might not feel this way. Let me make sure that I don't say, oh, well, don't we all feel this way? And be like, no, Watson, you're the only one. Here's the deal. Some days I feel like my job, not just, you know, ministry of word and sacrament, but some days I feel like my job is a, that I am a professional typer. Just typing stuff, typing words, you know, typed out a message for you all, like 4,000 words, like, you know, cranking them out. I got some emails. Some of you know, I, I love me some email, love sending me some email. <laughs> love them, like long ones is what I like to send. <laughs> you know, I think that some of us, we feel like we're professional typers, that most of what we do through the day is to type. And I've thought about how much of a dumpster fire I would be if I never took Miss Johnson's typing class in ninth grade. I was thinking about that this week, uh, and so I went and I took a typing test online. I just want to see, bask in my glory. I'm a professional typer. I'm probably typing like a kajillion words a minute. So I took a typing test just to see how I was doing. I came up, 71 words, 71 words a minute. 98.6% accuracy. I thought, solid. I said to my wife, Lisa, I said, babe, why don't you take this test? <laughs> she took the test. 75.6 words a minute. 97% accuracy. So I'm like, I, I don't know. Then I sent it to Pastor Andrea. She sent me back a screenshot of her score, 100 words a minute, 98% accuracy. She looked at Drew, which he's not here. I didn't get his permission. Sorry, Drew. She sent it to him. He sent me his screenshot, 64 words a minute. Hmm. Might need to brush up on his Mavis Beacon. Send it to the Reverend Dr. Justin Showoff Fung. <laughs> My man came in at 127 words a minute. 100% accuracy. I said, man, get out of here, bro. I'm blocking you on my text messages. If I need something typed, I'm sending it to you next time, bro. Now, I ask, so I ask, all of us use our proper placement of our hands. Uh, all of us have taken a typing course of some sort. Uh, we'd all gone through some process of kind of learning the basics, kind of posture and like sitting up and, you know, all of that. Um, over and over, muscle memory, and we've just sort of kept at it. Now, according to the American Society of Administrative Professionals, which is an organization I know nothing about, Right. For most people, the average typing speed is around 40 
words per minute. Seemed kind of low, but you know. However, for admins and executive assistants whose jobs rely uh, heavily on computer skills, the average typing speed is around 60 words a minute. If you can produce 80 words a minute, you're considered an advanced typist. Side note, while I was going down this rabbit hole of typing, uh, there's a 16-year-old gamer and YouTuber, Mythical Rocket, who just hit 300 words a minute. I watched his video on the YouTube. Uh, now, Mythical Rocket doesn't mention if he ever uh, took a typing class or not, but I watched the video of his hands, and he does put them in the proper uh, position, so I'm guessing he's taken a class or two. So there's that. So, you know, if you're looking for goals, 300 words a minute, there you go. The thing is to type well, to type fast, to type accurately, you have to, you know, you got to sit in a certain way. Uh, you know, you got to have good posture. You got to place your hands in a certain spot. Got to have good form. And you just have to practice. You just got to kind of keep at it. And these are the kind of the central things that you got to do if you want to be a decent typer. They're um, core practices, if you will. <coughs> practices that are central to being consistent, to getting better, and to, you know, holding steady. This is the case, by the way, with so many things. Uh, I could have come up with this about musical instruments. I don't play one, so it didn't really, I didn't know how to navigate that, so I just went with typing. But you could have done it with musical instruments, language learning, cooking, pottery, painting, uh, race car driving, like whatever it is. You gotta learn the form. There's some basic foundational practices that you have, certain central basic foundational exercises that you have to do in order to be consistent, to get better, and to hold steady. Now here's the thing, here's the turn. Over the course of the next few weeks for us at Christ City, we want to explore three practices that for us at Christ City are, similar, are similarly central to posture and to hand placement for typing. We refer to them as core practices, and the core practices are worship, community, and mission. Worship, community, and mission. Again, if you go back to our website and you look under the Who We Are tab, you'll see a subheading that simply says Our Calling. And in there, we express some of our better thoughts and imaginations, our, our aches and longings for who we want to be as a local church located and situated here in Northeast Washington, D.C. And near the top of the page where we share these core practices, this is what we wrote. To be followers of Jesus is to be on the journey of growth and transformation and learning to live. You hear echoes of this recent sermon series of learning to live about what it means to follow Jesus. I hope you're, you know, I'm trying to lay some breadcrumbs here. Journey of growth and transformation and learning to live as Jesus would, as individuals and as a community. And thus we seek to root ourselves in, and then we go on to say, worship, community, and mission. The way that we're structuring this series over the next few weeks, it's kind of like how you might structure maybe a, a, a college course or a science course, where you have a lecture and then you have a lab. One week, we're going to focus on one of the core practices and we're going to seek to lay out a biblical and theological foundation for this practice. And then the second week, we're going to have a panel discussion from a number of folks from Christ City on how they actually embody this practice in their own lives and in different areas of their lives. We'll spend some time understanding the, the praxis of this, prax, of this practice. Praxis simply means action, the action or a practice or practical application of a thing. And we'll go through this pattern over the course of the next six weeks, culminating in Pentecost Sunday. Theology and praxis around worship, community, and mission. The anchoring text for us in this passage, it comes out of one of the earliest expressions of the New Testament church in Acts chapter two. What we see emerging is a community of faith that's beginning to live into the life that Jesus wanted for them, a life that was to display God's love to the world, that would offer healing to those that found refuge in this community, that uh, displayed care for the common good of their neighbors, a, a community that cared for uh, their wider world, a community that was generous, a community that regularly reflected on the life, death, and resurrection and teachings of Jesus, a community that believed in the power of the Holy Spirit, and that believe that that power now resided in them individually and collectively. And what was emerging in Acts 2 was, was a spirit-empowered community that, that was propelled along by a vision of God's kingdom coming in their midst, in their lives, and in their neighborhoods as it was in heaven. To situate Acts 2 and the story that we've been in, um, even just 
most recently, Jesus has uh, risen from the grave. And he spent over a month with his disciples. And uh, not just the 12, but there's indication that he spent time with the wider community of believers as well. And Acts 1, verse 1, uh, Acts 1, 3, uh, notes that after Jesus' suffering, he presents himself to them, to the disciples, and he gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. And he appeared to them over 40 days, and he spoke about the kingdom of God. Then after that, Jesus is taken up into heaven, and the disciples, namely Peter and John, they remained there in Jerusalem. The religious holiday of Pentecost arrives, and Peter preaches to the crowds gathered at the temple there, and he shares a story, and he shares the story and meaning of Jesus. Acts says that thousands hear Peter's message uh, and come to a place of faith in Jesus. And these new believers, they, they, they begin to then gather at the temple in Jerusalem. And this is the formation of the first church. It's the first small group of a thousand people, a little bit bigger than ours. Um, and it's on the heels of all of this, of uh, the heels of Jesus' resurrection, the day of Pentecost, Peter preaching, the Spirit showing up in the lives of the disciples, people coming to faith, faith communities forming. It's on the heels of all of this that we come to the passage that we read earlier in Acts chapter 2. Verse 42, beginning, says this, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Verse 45, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. And they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. It's, it's in this description of this early church that we begin some of the, uh, some of the proto-core practices of worship and community and mission. They're breaking bread in homes. This is both the, the, just the mundane beauty of sharing simple meals with one another, yet it is now infused with spiritual meaning following Jesus' admonition in Luke 22 during the Last Supper with the disciples where he, wherein he instructs them, um, every time you do this, every time you do what? Every time you share a meal, remember me. Remember my love for you. Remember my sacrifice for you. Every time you break bread and pour the wine, remember what happened here. What Acts is describing is the formation of community. And they cared for those who had need. In this passage, it indicates that they're sharing with those in the community, in the, in the faith community. Though pretty quickly, uh, we'll see later that it begins to radiate out from the community and into those um, in the neighborhood and outside of their faith community. They begin to display generosity, financial generosity and spiritual generosity, whole life generosity to those that were inside and outside of the, their community. And in part because of their witness to the generosity of God and Jesus, others wanted to be a part of this new community. That's what's meant by our language of mission, a, a community uh, that is sent. They're also engaging in prayer and engaging with the apostles' teachings about Jesus' life and death and resurrection. They're seeing God perform signs and miracles in their midst. And there's a rhythm of their meeting at um, the temple where they are praising God. And it's here that we begin to see the first steps of a gathered worshiping community. And so on this last point that I want us to linger uh, just for a bit this morning. What is worship for us at Christ City? What do we mean by worship? What's happening when we worship, when we gather in this place together? Uh, when do we worship? How do we worship? There's a cascade of questions and considerations, and I will answer every single one of them in the next 15 minutes. <laughs> it's not going to happen. I don't type fast enough. <laughs> not going to be able to tackle all of them, but I do want to... Let me present a few approaches to worship that I think can help us get our minds around what we mean by this core practice of worship. Again, looking back at the way that we've articulated this on, on the website and in other places, we so say that worship is our lived response, collectively and individually, to God's great love displayed in the work of Christ and our shared life in the Spirit. Worship is a response, a response. At its base level, it's just a, it's a response. And what are we responding to? To God's great love as displayed in Christ. 
Worship is us responding to something. It's, worship is what comes up and out of us when we consider the love of God. When we gaze up at who God is and what God has done on our behalf, when we remember the ways that God has embraced us and healed us and welcomed us and reminded us and shaped us and renewed us and blessed us and journeyed with us, when we remember all of those things, when we consider how God has held us and we remember who God is, our response to that is worship. Whatever comes out in that moment, when we're on our own doing this individually and when we're gathered here in this space, that's collectively. But what we're doing, whether we're on our own or whether we're all together, it's the same. We're responding to God's love that has been shown to us. When we gather here each week, that's, that's really what we're aiming to do. When we pray and we recite prayers as we've already done, when we sing and when we read scriptures, uh, all of what we are doing is aimed at remembering God's love towards us and responding to that love as a community. Last Sunday, Easter Sunday. Now, look, two of the biggest differences between last Sunday and this Sunday, first, we have more people. I mean, you know. Folks are, you know, eclipse is coming, so they're in different spots. <laughs> Second is we had a photo booth. And maybe there's some other things. We had two services. I know. We had flower walls. I mean, I, you know, just track with me. But our liturgy, our, our order of service, it was not too dissimilar from what we were doing right now. And the reason for that is we want people to get a picture of what Christ, uh, a picture of Christ City that they could see or that they would see any Sunday out of the year. And second, because what we're doing each and every Sunday that we gather is we're just simply responding to God's love. Yeah. And each movement in our service is informed by this definition of, of worship. How are we responding? Collectively, in this case, on a Sunday, as we are the gathered church, we are responding to God's love as shown in Jesus. And we sing. We sing because the church has always sung its responses to God's love. We have an entire book of the Bible, the Psalms. This is a song book, not to mention the numerous hymns, poems, songs, and spiritual songs that are dropped into various books throughout the Old and New Testament. Oftentimes, our responses to God and to God's love, it's creative, and so we stand in that tradition. We celebrate baptism. Last week, we celebrated Will's baptism, one, uh, one who has come to the place of saying, I want my whole life to be a response to God's love. I'm declaring today in front of my community that I want to follow Jesus. Easter isn't the only time that we baptize, and so if you would like to be baptized, you don't have to wait. You don't have to wait. We pray. We pray prayers of our own words. We pray prayers of the Lord's Prayer because we want to respond to God with our words, but also our collective voices. We keep the children in the service for, for much of the service for the first part for a few reasons. First, because we want to communally and collectively model for our young people a shared response to God's love. But also, and I would even say more importantly, we need to hear and be present to our young people's voices as they find their own voice in response to God's love. I need their presence in my life for my own growth and godliness. I need for my ears to hear their songs. I need to watch them as they worship and learn what it is to respond to God's love. I need that in my own life. We preach and we, we uh, read scripture uh, and open the scriptures together as a way to remember how God has loved us in the past and consider how God might love us today. And also to consider how God may invite us to display God's love to those that are around us. And we come to the communion table every week. Always the turn back to what Jesus has done on our behalf. Always remembering God's great love. Each week, body and blood of Christ broken and shed for you. When we gather in this communal act. But it's not just a. When we gather here on Sunday, it's, it is a communal act, but it's not just a communal act because it's public. For our response to be communal, it actually requires that, they, that there be a community of voices. That's actually what the word liturgy, I've used it a few times, it's actually what it means. It simply means the work of the people in Latin. This is why we have multiple preachers. 
multiple voices that represent multiple histories and experiences of faith. So we have multiple worship leaders, multiple people serving communion at different times, multiple folks serving on the prayer team, multiple people teaching children in Kid City. It's not just a religious version of like volunteer management. It's an expression of communal faith. Worship, responding to God. I've been thinking about this approach to the communal worship this week, this collective approach to worship that Christ City has chosen. And, and I, I know that we meet in a school cafeteria and, you know, that comes with certain challenges at some times. And I know that navigating different voices that preach, you know, some because you, maybe you come from a tradition where it's just one person they preach, you know, most of the time. And, and you know, and it can be different to hear different voices leading uh, in worship and all of that. But the thing that I want to say to you is that what we're seeking to elevate in all of this is our collective response to God's love. To say what we're doing is we're trying to worship together. That's what makes this a collective, a communal response as we gather together. We're wanting to elevate the multitude of voices that make this wild community of faith called Christ City Church so that we can hear all of the ways that we're responding to God and God's love as revealed in Christ and the wide and wild ways that the Spirit is empowering us all. This is why we gather each week and why we gather collectively. And it's a little bit of the why behind how, the why behind the how we gather each week. Did I say that right? Pick up what I'm putting down? Perfect. But our worship isn't only what we do on Sundays as we're gathered as a church body. This is is a unique and and absolutely important and central feature to our faith of, of, of shared faith, of gathering together each week on Sundays. But all of our worship as followers of Jesus, it's not contained in the 90 minutes that we gather here on Sunday. Our definition points that out. Worship is our our lived response collectively and individually to God's great loves displayed in Christ. Our lived response, it's not only collective, but it's also individual. Now, I got, I've labored over whether or not to even share this with you. But I'm gonna step out, just gonna let you know. I hope you don't run away. I have a confession to make. I love all of you. I'm feeling anxious even just saying I love all of you. I'm glad that we're here. Sunday's not it for me. It's, I love being here with you. But Sundays aren't the, the primary way that I connect with God. Um, I, now, don't get me wrong. At different times, this has bothered me in my life. Um, it's made me wonder, to be honest, like, is there something wrong with me spiritually? Like, is there, is there sin or is there something in my life that I got to figure out? Like, how come I don't feel it every, you know, Sunday when I walk in here and I'm like, let's go, like, praise the Lord. Like, what is, is there something deficient in me? And like I said, I've even waffled about whether or not to share this news with you because I don't want you to be like, well, Watson doesn't even like this. I'm out. Like, that's not, <laughs> please don't do that to me. Um, <laughs> We gather for a different reason. I gather here, and even at some point in the future, if I'm no longer a pastor, I will continue the rhythm of gathering with the saints for all of the reasons that I mentioned earlier, that I need the other voices in my life, and I need to join with other voices to remember the thousand ways that uh, we respond to God's love towards us. But I've also got to find my own voice in worship. And so do you. So how do you worship? What's the, what's the most true response in you? What's your most true response to God's love? In his incredibly helpful book, Sacred Pathways, Christian author Dr. Ter- Gary Thomas, he identifies nine common paths. And um, this book has been really helpful for me. Um, uh, kind of common pathways that people have for connecting with God individually. Now, I'm not going to go through all nine this morning, but I will share a few. And by the way, as a resource, um, I have included a link. Uh, it'll be in the chat, and it'll also be in the small group guides and other places where you can learn more about these pathways. There's also a little survey you can take to figure out, well, you know, I don't know, which, how do I connect with the Lord? And you can let an online survey tell you how. <laughs> Go.christcitydc.org slash sacred pathways. One of the ways is, uh, and this is a way that, that is most meaningful for me, is uh, what uh, Thomas, Dr. Thomas calls a naturalist. 
loving God through the outdoors. Author and theologian G.R. Woodward, who's reflecting on uh, this pathway, describes those that are most inclined to worship in this way. He says this, any place that has some trees or a stream or at minimum open skies can be God's cathedral. Naturalists have found that getting outside can literally flood parched hearts and soften the heart of soul. Naturalists often learn their best lessons in the out of doors. Three in particular come to mind. They visualize scriptural truths. They see God more clearly. And they learn to rest. Um, every year I take a retreat of solitude. I travel to a ranch in West Texas. It's kind of a desert, really. And I just sit. I watch the sun come up. I listen to coyotes bark at me. I read my journals from the previous two years. And I write prayers. And I read scripture. And I watch the natural world come alive. And I worship Some of you, maybe it's more the traditionalists, what some can call a traditionalist, where you worship through ritual and symbol. Some of you respond to God's love in ways that are meaningful for you. In this way, you, you memorized prayers or passages. You've come to liturgical prayers or prayer books you find really deeply moving for you. Some of you pray the, like to pray the hours of the day like many monks and nuns do in their monastic orders. You love walking through the stations of the cross or a stained glass or ornate cathedrals or what cause your heart to soar. And that's the place where you respond to God's love. For the others of you, you respond to God's love through confrontation and standing against injustice as activists do. Activism can take on the form of protest or community organizing or rallies or any form of advocacy. For those that feel most connected to God through action and activism, you'll want to experience the exhilaration of seeing a miraculous God come through in miraculous ways on behalf of the poor and the marginalized and oppressed. And that's your response of worship. For some of you, you you love God with your mind. You connect with God less through your senses and less through even actions, but more with your your mind. Intellectuals, they they, they feel that in order to be growing in Christ, they need to have their minds stimulated with scriptures and other books and podcasts and articles and intellectual pursuits. They they need to be challenged. And if they're not learning new things about God, then their relationship with God feels stagnant. Intellectuals remind us of the high calling of loving God with our mind. Um, uh, Eric Brown, uh, who's on the production, I told him I was going to tell him this. He told me not to, but (laughs) I love him too much to not. He used to lead a small group for years that dedicated themselves to just this pursuit. They lovingly referred to themselves as the nerd small group. There are so many ways that we can engage with and worship God. Sensates or ascetics, caregivers, enthusiasts, contemplatives, all of these. And this isn't an exhaustive list by any stretch. And neither is it that you're only one way and not another. The point is that there isn't a single way to worship. There's one God, one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But they are, there are a thousand ways to worship this Lord of ours. The aim is for you to discover the way that's most meaningful for you so that you can respond in the most authentic way and the most vibrant way to the God that loves you passionately. Yes, we worship together collectively, but we also worship individually. The last thing that I want to say about worship is that worship is also a way of life. Again, our definition, worship is our lived response. Our lived response to God's great love. The opening phrase is, it, 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 it's wooing us to a, a, life, a, a way of worship that's lived out, that is embodied. Worship isn't only how we respond on Sundays as a gathered community. And worship isn't only how we respond individually in those moments of personal silence and solitude or protest or research or service. Worship in many ways ought to be our whole lives. Our whole lives as a form of worship, as a, as a response to God's love. In his letter to the church in Rome, the Apostle Paul touches on this in Romans 12 where he writes, Therefore I urge you, siblings, in view of God's mercy, 
to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Paul is imploring the church in that ancient capital city, in that ancient empire, to offer their bodies, their lives, as uh, their living as a form of worship. Their living, the, the ways that they live their lives should be a lived response to God's great love. The passage right before it, by the way, in, in Romans 11, verse 39, the, Romans 12, 1 begins, therefore, and so good biblical scholars that you are, you always know to sort of look back, therefore what? Romans eleven thirty eight. 38, it says this, from him, from God, from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever, amen. Paul's actually quoting a psalm. He's quoting a, a hymn that the early church would have sung, that the church in Rome would have known. He said, God, he's saying God is great and God is marvelous and amazing and let us not lose sight of that. And because God is good, therefore, let your whole life be lived in response to, the, to God's goodness. Our worship isn't only on Sunday. And it isn't only on those times when I get a personal retreat or get to get away or get to go to the National Cathedral or those morning times with the Lord or amazing walks around the tidal basin when the cherry blossoms are in full bloom and there's not a tourist in sight. Like if I have to wait for that in order to worship well, then, well, that's not the invitation either. Monday through Saturday, worship. Your lives and your living as a form of worship. And this has to frame how I show up on Monday, how I go into the office. I go in worship, lived response to God's love. As I go to the job site, instead of viewing it as another day, another dollar, I view it as a response to God's great love. It's worship. How I parent my kiddos. Hey, listen, I'm gonna tell you, I took Lisa to the airport this morning at four o'clock in the morning. I'm like locked in with these kids by myself. <laughs> An opportunity to worship. How I parent, how I show up in their lives. How I show up in my neighborhood as a response of worship. As I got some bills to pay, got to pay some bills. How do I sit down to get ready to, <clears throat> I was going to say write checks. I know y'all not with me on that. Like <laughs> log in, like how I got a bank. <laughs> it's a form of worship. How I handle my money in a way that is in response to God's great love. How I clean my house as a form of worship. As I weed my garden as a form of worship. As I watch the news, as I sit down, as I live and breathe and move and walk and play. Wherever it is that I come and go, I'm worshiping. I'm responding to God's great love that's poured out to us. Jesus, Saints, this week, what I want you to do is I want us to all consider the ways and places that we get to live as worshipers, as those who are invited to live in light of God's great love displayed to us. That's our call. That's our invitation. Let me pray for us. Come, Holy Spirit. Spirit of God, I pray that whatever ways that we need to be reminded, God, maybe before we even get to worship, we just need to be reminded that you love us. And we just need to sit in the truth of, of that truth for a minute. And Spirit, let your presence wash over us and remind us and say to us, child, I love you. so much that I sent Jesus to show you. Spirit, I pray that that you would just, that that would be our first step. That you would say to us and that you would remind us that you do love us, you care for us, you embrace us, you save us and heal us. That you're with us in the hard spots and in the easy ones. So God, I pray that that we would, that we would remember and that we would have an experience of your love towards us. A spirit that you would show us what, what our response ought look like, what our worship in this moment and in the moments that are ahead of us 
what our response of worship ought to look like. Spirit, stir in us an imagination. Comfort us as we look at your invitation to worship you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.